Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the POK Podcast. Today's topic, we're going to be talking about foster care. But before we get into that, there's a couple things that I think we should take the time to really discuss that's been going on in the news this week. Um, At the time that we're filming this, it was the same week that we had the Santa Fe High School shooting and also the time where the new NFL policy restricting players from kneeling during the anthem uh, was also enacted. So I just want to take like maybe the first 10, 20 minutes just to kind of give our thoughts on it, process it. It's been kind of a, a heavy week news-wise. Definitely. That's, that's really like one of the biggest downsides to this podcast is that we spend so much time staying up to date with what's going on in the news. Let's so try and you know build some supplementary uh, materials for our, our actual podcast episode. And so we get exposed to this stuff all the time, and especially when it's just a week full of really heavy news. It can be really draining, demoralizing, and distracting. So let's just take the first 20 minutes to really just kind of give our thoughts on these two things. You know, what were our initial reactions after looking into it a little bit more? What did we, you know, kind of come to as our conclusion on these things? So let's just start with the Santa Fe High School shooting. So at this point, (laughs) I feel like this this is happening like every other week. Yeah, me too. Uh, This one hit me pretty hard. Uh, I, I have a real hard time reading about these things and not getting at least a little bit emotional and uh, and angry and sad. And uh, when all those emotions are kind of flooding in, I have a real hard time uh, being objective and just trying to say, OK, well, what's really going on here? How can we fix this? Uh, what was your initial reaction? Uh, I just I don't know how many times this is going to have to happen before people stop arguing and we have a really like common sense discussion about the best way to fix this. Cause like you said, I feel like it just keeps happening and I feel like we have this problem and other countries don't. And I, I just don't understand why we can't come to a conclusion that benefits both gun owners and people that are concerned about their safety as well as their children's safety. There, there has to be a way to take this chaos and learn from it and improve our society. But I feel like no one wants to do that. No one in power anyway. Yeah. And it's a really, it's always kind of been a real controversial topic, but just gun violence in general, gun rights, Mm -hmm. there's, there's so much, uh, just emotion behind that and people that are really steadfast in their political ideologies about it. And what they believe about what you know gun rights should be, whether they shouldn't be touched at all, or if there is a possibility to come up with some sort of policy change that might actually reduce gun violence. And so, for me, my initial reaction was, okay, what what do we actually know about gun violence? Like, you know, I, I had looked into it before briefly, but I hadn't really do it, didn't uh, I hadn't really done a deep dive into what do we actually know who there has to be someone that's done some research on these policies to figure out Mm -hmm. which ones work and which ones don't Mm -hmm. and we ended up posting something on our facebook uh, uh, page kind of listing or citing an article that really kind of brought together the summation of what we actually know about gun violence and gun policies and really there was only there was like only a couple uh real conclusions worth mentioning for one Relevant to the number of deaths caused by gun violence, the amount of research that goes into it is ridiculously underfunded. Mm -hmm. So when I say relevant to the amount of deaths uh, or or fatalities, what I mean is if you look at, say, cancer, for example, cancer is one of the leading causes of death in our country and as such has a ton of funding behind research and how to fix that problem. Gun violence has a still a relatively high number of deaths. But relative to that number, the funding that goes into it is disproportionate relative to these other problems that cause fatalities in our country. Right. And so that was kind of frustrating to hear. But it it made sense with the kind of political environment that we have going on right now. And it's really hard to get some of that research done and get funding for that research when there's all this political backlash that can come from it. The second thing uh, and and, the. This is often a a point about gun violence that I feel like doesn't really get talked about enough is that two thirds of all gun violence deaths are due to suicide. Right. Right. And so it it surprises me that with all the talks that we have about gun violence and these school shootings, that that also doesn't come up. Right. 
But one of the most interesting things that I learned and actually made the Santa Fe uh, shooting, I guess, demoralize me even more, was that the one policy that we can objectively say reduces gun violence is safe storage uh, policy, safe storage, uh, keeping guns away from underage kids. Right. That's the one policy that has been demonstrated to significantly reduce gun violence. Well, and it makes sense, too, right? Uh, We talked about this last week um, with children not having their prefrontal cortex fully developed. So why would you allow anyone under the age of, I mean, technically, your prefrontal cortex doesn't develop until, like, 23 to 25, right? So... Why would you let anyone under that age who doesn't understand um, or doesn't have the capacity to fully understand action and consequence, why would you give them access to a deadly weapon? Well, t- to that point, I-, I do think there's a valid counter argument to that in the sense that if you say raise the age to 25, right, Okay. when your brain is in theory done fully developing, right? why is it that people from ages you know, 18 to 25 – are not entitled to the same form of quote unquote self defense as any other citizen, and so wh- where I can see that getting uh, mixed up in is you're saying you can't own a self defense tool until you're up until you're age 25. Now, while I actually would you know ag- agree with that, I would say that yeah, that's probably a, a policy that we should look into is raising the or at least raising the minimum age to purchase a firearm. Mm-hmm. Um, the but only... I can I can see where the pushback would be. Oh, definitely. Um, but I would posit that there are other ways, there are other devices you can use to defend yourself, not just a gun. Um, you there, there's tasers, there's pepper spray, there's all kinds of things that you can do that are not deadly weapons to defend yourself. Um, and I'm sure a counter argument is, you know, if someone is old enough to serve in the military, then um, they should be on a, a, old enough to, to own a gun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My counter argument to that is the people that are in the military are trained to properly handle and discharge and use and care for those guns. Yeah. When a just random 18 year old is not. So if you want to be able to have a gun before you're 25, let's say, if that was the policy, then you have to go through military training. Yeah, no, I, I, for, for me, it's like, you know, if you're going to be using something, uh, a, a weapon of that caliber, mm-hmm. and you don't have training with it, you don't have uh, an expertise with it, if you don't know how to clean it, you know, mm-hmm. if you don't know how to store it, what just, uh, proper gun courtesy like you know don't point it whether it's loaded or unloaded you don't point a gun at anyone no unless you plan on shooting them <laughs> uh and so it, you know little things like that sure i think we could we could come down on uh but just in, to keep it relevant to the santa fe case mm-hmm. uh i've heard actually quite a bit of criticism asking why weren't the parents held liable to some extent for what this kid did because the guns were owned by the parents and I, I can totally see why you you can make a very valid point and just say, well, it wasn't the parents that shut up the school, it was the kid. Right, obviously. Right? But to some extent, it is a, I would argue, and you know, many of you might have an, a, a different opinion, but to some extent, it is the parents' responsibility to make sure that their weapons and firearms are properly stored and kept away uh, from their children, from their kids Absolutely. who have no reason or business carrying around one of these firearms. Absolutely. So one of the recommendations actually from the study that we had posted was make it a felony to not properly store your weapon. Right. That's, that's one solution. I don't – I would love to hear your guys' opinions on that. It, it, it's an option. Uh, more research obviously needs to be done. But the one – again, the one policy we know has some empirical evidence behind it is safe storage laws. Right. And another really interesting point, and then we'll move on to the NFL policy. Mm-hmm. Uh, was that in states where you're able to s- claim self-defense after discharging your firearm, right. what they actually saw is that that policy actually positively correlated with increased gun violence, hmm. which I thought was interesting. I don't really have a great explanation for it. Those were the numbers that they provided. Right. I don't know whether or not that's a good enough reason to say <laughs> that we should relook at that policy, right. but 
it's interesting. Mm-hmm. I agree. I think it's worth mentioning, and I would love to hear you guys' opinions on that. Absolutely. What your thoughts are. Absolutely. And so just moving along, we'll, we'll jump right into the NFL policy bit. So for those of you who haven't heard, the NFL enacted a policy that would penalize players, I think fine them, yeah. if they chose to take a knee during the national anthem. The caveat was that they said that players would be allowed to stay in the locker room during the national anthem if they decided they didn't want to stand for it. So, again, this is another kind of mixed bag of emotions for me. Yeah. Uh, I, so tell me your thoughts. So I, I, I struggle with this um, in regard to approaching it from a logical um, perspective because my emotional perspective is very much uh, I am a hardcore uh, supporter of the First Amendment, especially freedom of speech and how important it is. But I also understand that the NFL is a private company and they are welcome to do as they please to benefit or support their business in a way that they feel is necessary. Um, So, yeah, it's just, it's difficult and I I feel some type of way. I'm trying not to be too mean uh, because I have a lot of mean opinions inside of me. Um, Yeah, it's just, it's a very difficult pill to swallow because for me it says we care more about our advertising and our pockets than we do about these players and their beliefs. Um, th- at least that is that is the message that I received, uh, especially after we learned that they did not consult the players' union before making this decision. Yeah, that was probably the, the biggest blow to me. So right. it wasn't so much the policy itself that right. irked me. It was the timing of it, the way it was kind of went about mm. – the lack of informing the players or the players association and at, at this point in time it actually creates a potential legal problem for the NFL so right. we again this is something that we, we had posted on if you're interested in some of the legality issues that are uh, surrounded with this particular policy please right. check that out give your thoughts and opinions it's on our Facebook page you guys can check it out weigh in we've got a lot of a lot of engagement on there a lot of interesting conversation happening if you're interested yeah and so one of the things about this particular policy is that it could run into a problem with the concerted activity clause in our uh, labor laws. Right. So basically what that clause says is that if you are employees that uh, are a part of a, a union, right. that if you do any kind of political protest, mm-hmm. it has to meet a couple of conditions, right? So it has to uh, be relevant to your job right. and could argue and counter argue as well that them protesting police brutality or, or excessive force or lack of due process in the law um, doesn't directly affect them. And there's well, uh, uh, there's a recent story that kind of uh, yeah, countered that right so with my, Sterling Brown. My counter argument to that is that, I mean, although Sterling Brown was not, it wasn't at his job or because of his job, it was because he, w- he had parked illegally, I believe, he was in a um, handicapped spot. He had parked in a handicapped spot, um, and it should have just been, here's your ticket, please move your car. But it turned into them tasing someone who was a professional NBA player. Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, that says it doesn't matter how much money or power anyone, professional athlete or celebrity has, if you're a minority and somebody doesn't know who you are, you're subject to the same treatment as everyone else. Yeah. And as we see, it's discriminatory, especially – Um, everything that's happened with you know certain cop and uh, justice situations uh. yeah so I I think you can make a fairly strong case that it is relevant to their job performance right right and the other thing is that they have to do it in concert with one another right so it can't just be one person right so they have to to do that and also they can't skip out on the job for it exactly they're not Uh, allowed to miss work so uh, i think you can build a pretty strong case that all those things are valid in this particular instance so i think it really depends on what the players want to do and what the players association wants to do but here's really my two cents on it from the nfl's perspective i think they i think they botched this one and here's why it's not that the policy that they came up with was a completely unreasonable policy no it was 
Uh, it was the sketchy way in which they did it. Y- yes. So it was a, part of it's the timing. If they enacted this policy right after Cap- Kaepernick took like his first knee or really just started uh, taking a knee, right? And it was just maybe a few players or just one, one or two players that were doing it. They would have gotten away with this policy, no problem. There probably wouldn't have been a whole lot of backlash. Right. You and players still had the opportunity to protest. Mm-hmm. Uh, they just couldn't do it during the national anthem. Right. Would have been fine, but now that it did become this concerted activity, it it poses some problems for the NFL because they, it, they it, it looks bad. Long. It looks bad on them. Right. It makes it look like they're they're kind of bullying the players. A they're little sellouts. Bit it makes them look like sellouts. Yeah, and the other thing, the other part that really bothered me was that the commissioner of the NFL came out and said that these protests have nothing to do with disrespecting the flag or the military. Uh, before and, before they enacted the yeah, policy. Yeah, and that, and, and that you know he fully supported the players' right to do so. And then turns around and they, there's this unanimous decision amongst owners to say, oh, yeah, well, we're not going to let them protest this way anymore. <sighs> it's the order of events that's sketchy. Yeah. It's again, this policy could have been enacted in a very humane and rational and uh, well informed way that included the players into the, uh, the conversation, but it didn't. Well, and the way I see it too is that I have worked for people that cared more about the, the numbers at the end of the day than they did their employees, and they were awful jobs. And I've worked for people that cared more about the employees than the numbers, and, and they were great jobs. So this is just an example of that to me. It, it, is, it is, without words, it is very clearly saying, we don't care about you, just play football. We care about our bank account. That, that's a, a one way to take it, absolutely. Um, yeah, At least that's how I see it, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it's, like I said, it's a whole mixed bag of emotions. Because on one hand, I'm like, I, I can totally see where the NFL is coming from. Like, oh, this for is, sure. This doesn't look good for their business. Well, and it, and it's, so they wanted it's, to make a proactive decision to try and fix it. The NFL is not, I can understand where they're saying, you know, this is for entertainment purely. This is not the platform for protest. I can understand where they're coming from with that. But their decision to not consult the players union and just like well, like we said, just very sketchily handle this, it makes me a little bit more upset than if they would have handled it properly. Yeah, and uh, just the last point on this, uh, as far as the legality of it goes, is there's a, a collective bargaining agreement that goes into their contract, the player's uh, contract. So your employer can't just change the terms of your employment without consulting you. Mm-hmm. It has to be a fair negotiation. Right. It can, the, a case can be made that that didn't happen here. That's another kind of, uh, you know, sketchy component to this. Right. And it really, again, comes back down to why didn't they just talk to the Players Association about this? Why didn't they just try to... Uh, fairly negotiate this Mm -hmm. it just seems a little bit weird and poorly implemented just to say yeah well all of a sudden now we're gonna enact this policy it's a little it's just too little too late yeah there are multiple ways to better handle this and they choose none of chose none of them so we'll see how that plays out i'm sure i'm sure we will have more information come out about that especially in august when the season starts yeah so. e- even by the time that this podcast goes live some of the information about that could have come out already yeah and exactly who knows we'll see uh so now into the, the foster topic care for today. system yeah yeah so why don't you tell us how we kind of got into this topic yeah so um over mother's day i believe yeah so we had a cookout at my family's house for mother's day and um my aunt and uncle so it's my mom's brother um, have been, spent the last like year and a half um, raising funds to adopt a child. And they're going through closed adoption through this uh, agency. And this was not really something that me and Dylan were familiar with. So we were asking them tons of questions because, first of all, it is insanely expensive. Yeah. It was like, what was it? It was over 20 grand. I know. Um, but a pri- was, uh, they were doing private adoption. They were doing a private Christian adoption. So they were telling us what all the money was for and, like, you know, the process of them making a profile. And the mothers come in and they pick the family that they think is going to match up with their child best. Um, and it's only uh, newborns. So it's a pregnant mother that's picking out the family for her, you know, soon-to-be child to go to. And so we were just asking them all kinds of questions. And 
that led us to look into, okay, well, what is private adoption versus public adoption? Mm -hmm. What is that versus the foster care system? And so once we kind of got into it, we realized that there was a whole topic here um, that needed to be discussed. Yeah, we were kind of like jumbling between whether we wanted to tackle like international adoption or uh, private adoptions, but it seemed like the bulk of the conversation that needed to be had was around foster care. Because all in all, domestic private adoption is, is... is good. Um, obviously, any system has some issues, but from our research, private domestic adoption is pretty safe and good. International adoption gets into some problems, um, but the meat of the issues come from the foster care system. Yeah, and so we should just kind of say right off the bat that we're, we're, we're in, in this podcast, we are going to be critiquing a little bit of the po- foster care system and, mm-hmm. and maybe some of the policies and the way that we've looked at it, but. It was started on relatively virtuous terms. Right. So let's get into our little mini history lesson here so we can <laughs> build up some context for this discussion. Time to learn. <laughs> Teachers in the building. Teachers in the building. In the 1500s in England, they had this policy called the English Poor Laws. Okay. So what this allowed uh, the government to do was to place poor oh. children into indentured servitude. Okay. So the United States would end up adopting a very similar practice. Mm -hmm. And this can very much be interpreted as the very beginning of what we think of as the foster care system today. All right. So it's the idea of taking children out of poor or abusive uh, abusive families Mm -hmm. and then putting them into what we would think is a a better off situation. And I would would really like to, to... emphasize the better off part because that is a theme that we notice tremendously in our research which is that just about every single policy that we've seen around foster care in the history of foster care is followed up by this idea that kids are better off away from their birth parents or their birth family whatever the situation with that family is than with them yeah they're, right. they're, they're better off in foster care or getting adopted right so keep that in mind. Right. So in 1853, a name, a man by the name of Charles Loring Brace founded the Children's Aid a- Society in New York City. Um, so he witnessed uh, immigrant children basically sleeping on the streets and living in uh, very deplorable conditions, and he really wanted to do something about it. So the movement he started was known as the Orphan Train Movement. Um, and it sent approximately 150,000 orphan children to farms all across the U.S. via train hence the name Orphan Train Movement. So some of these kids were treated relatively well, and they were considered part of the family. And in other cases, it was pretty much forced slavery. Um, But the emphasis of this movement was still focused on providing a family life to kids who otherwise didn't have one or didn't have, you know, even a A home or clothes or that kind of thing. Um, And this premise continues throughout the modern-day foster care system that we have today, but there are some changes that have been made. Yeah, so it wasn't really until about the 20th century, so early 20th century, did we actually start having social agencies check in on these foster-like homes. Mm -hmm. So they were just kind of putting kids into families without any kind of regulation as to what was going on in those families. Fun! Little little sketchy, right? Yeah. Uh, So this is also really one of the big turning points uh, for the mission statement of foster care. Mm -hmm. So originally, their goal was just to take kids out of bad families. Right. Or to take or to take in orphan kids, right? Generally virtuous, generally a good idea. You would think to be a good idea on right, paper, obviously. Uh, but something happened. So instead, now of just saying, "Okay, we want to take kids away from harmful homes," or uh, to put orphan kids into uh, adopted families, we want to reunite children with their birth families. Right. The irony is that this didn't even come close to happening for about another century. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> right. Okay. Or, or, you know, in a good 80 years. Right. So keep that in mind. So the mission statement changed. The reality didn't. Mm-hmm. So over the next century, foster care became incrementally more and more regulated. Okay. So they were a little bit more sh- – uh, you had caseworkers looking at the foster care parents. Right. You had social agencies working to get kids adopted. Mm-hmm. But – as we'll kind of see in this next couple of bits, the benefit to the children seems to be lacking. Right. So in the 1970s, the number of kids in the foster care system skyrocketed 
So this led President Nixon to pass the Child Abuse and Prevention and Treatment Act in okay. 1974. Okay. So things to know about this act. It tightened, up, it tightened up the abuse reporting laws. Okay. So it made it so school teachers, uh, other institution leaders could report cases of abuse. Okay. Okay. So it also offered federal grants to the states to improve their foster care system. Okay. So now they're getting federal money and putting it into the states. Right. But there's two things that happened in the late 70s okay. that are worth uh, – uh, that, that, that really affected the uh, foster care system. All right. So the first one is that there was an economic recession. Right. That's important because anytime there's a, a problem with the economy, and particularly uh, when it comes to a recession, the number of foster care kids entering the system increases. Right, because people can't afford to have children. They have their children anymore. Yeah, and so when, as we'll see, cases of neglect went way up. Obviously. Yeah. And neglect is this very broad, generalized term that we'll, we should probably discuss that towards yeah. the end as well, of what even that means, mm -hmm. since the majority of foster care kids that enter, or, or, or kids that are sent to the foster care system, are sent there due to cases of neglect. Neglect. Quote, unquote, neglect. Whatever that means. So the other thing that passed uh, was the Adoptions Assistance and Child Welf Welfare Act in 1980. Okay. This is a big deal. So around 1977, the number of kids in foster care was around half a million. So this is a, that's, prob that's near the all-time high for kids in foster care. Okay. Today, that number is very similar. It's like 442,000, something like that, close to the half million mark. Right. So the goal here is that they wanted to figure out how do we get these kids out of the foster care system? We don't have enough people, uh, uh, foster care families. We don't have enough caseworkers. We got to figure out a way to get these kids out of foster care. Right. And so more or less what it did was is it promoted adoption okay okay and so uh the adoption assistance and child welfare act uh, was a way of compensating for the massive influx of kids and it required also required child welfare agencies to make reasonable efforts to reunite families or look for alternative permanent per permanent permanency permanency, permanency options, options. <laughs> but as we'll see the emphasis was on the alternative permanency options right. as opposed to reuniting families. Uh, by, the 19, by 1984, the number of kids uh, in foster care because of this policy was nearly cut in half. So approximately 276,000 kids were in the system. Since then, the number of kids entering the foster care system continued to increase, more so than the number leaving the program. Um, there's a couple reasons uh, that this was occurring. Uh, first of all, substance abuse saw a spike and kind of hand in hand with that during the 80s and 90s, the HIV AIDS epidemic um, was in full swing. Um, obviously, substance abuse at the time and the AIDS epidemic uh, kind, of, kind of go together. By 1992, the number of kids in foster care that were entering the system shot up in addition to the time they spent within the system. Uh, this was about the time it became apparent that the philosophy of seeking permanent homes for kids in foster care was not a suitable solution. Well, it just wasn't sustainable. Yeah, it's right. You yeah. Had, you, so here, here's the thing with the adoptions or, or, or trying to get kids adopted from foster right. care is that it, there's a lot of barriers to that. Right. Well, so, we can we can discuss why there's issues with adopting kids out. Right. Um, well, yeah, part part of it has to do with the fact that there's just not enough people adopting. Exactly. Right? So that's an important thing to, to mention here, I think, because so many of these solutions that we're going to be talking about here or, or policies right. are really emphasizing adopt, adopt right. kids out of foster care. And they're not the – so at this time when this was all going on, they started to get harsh criticism because they did not feel that they were making reasonable efforts to reunite these children with their yeah. biological families as opposed to really trying to force them to be adopted. Yeah, and so – Again, anytime there's an influx in, excuse me, foster ki or kids entering the foster care system, Congress says, "Oh, we got to step in. We have to do something about the influx mm -hmm, of kids." Mm -hmm. Here's the insanity of it: is that they try the same solution over, over and, and over, over again. again. So, 1993, Congress enacted the Family Preservation and Family Support Program as a way of funding states to implement family preservation and community-based support services. Mm -hmm. 
The goal was to increase the rate at which kids would return to their families. Right. Here's the problem. That also didn't end up happening. It's the same policy. And once they realized that that, that wasn't ending up happening, they said, well, we'll just double down on right. adoptions. Exactly. So in 1997, the program was expanded via the Adoption and Safe Families Act passed by President Clinton. Okay. The reality was, and in still many ways today, is that we view finding a permanent residence for the kid as more valuable, or an alternative permanent residence, mm-hmm. as more valuable than sending the kids back to their family. Right. And there's a lot of research today that says that that's actually more harmful to the kid. That it's actually, even if they're in a relatively unstable family, their life outcomes tend to be better if they remain in that family as opposed to going to the foster care system. Right. That's the scary part. But once again, we kept with it. Mm-hmm. So what this did, and this is some of the craziness to it, I think, is that it put a really short time frame on how long parental or parents could keep their custody rights. Right. So if after 12 months they didn't get their kid back, their parental rights are gone. Right, and um, we were talking about the other day, right, that they had started fining parents. Yeah, so uh, I can't remember. the. I, I don't want to be inaccurate about this, but there was a state that had tried – uh, something different. They were like, okay, well, uh, even if a kid's in foster care, the parents should still be paying for their kid. Right, like basically paying child support. Yeah, so when their kids were taken away from them, they were then required by law to pay stipends to the foster parent to take care of their kid. Meanwhile, they're also supposed to be getting back on their feet within 12 months to get their child back. But <laughs> yeah, and whatever. So, well, I mean, the result of it was that it actually ended up to increase the length at which kids stayed in foster care, increased the rate at which kids were not returned to their families. Of course it did. Of course it did. And ultimately ended up costing the parents a lot of money. Right. And the state a lot of money because the longer kids in foster care, the more expensive it is for the state. Right. Uh, we'll, we'll try and find that article and, and, and link it and, down and below. Link it down yeah. below. Uh, what a dumb idea. Yeah. So what this act did in 1997, though, uh, aside from putting a, a really short time frame on the parental rights at 12 months, it offered a bunch of incentives for states to promote adoption. Hmm. Right? So, and it, it did, did just that. Right. Between 1998 and 1999, the number of adoptions out of the foster care system increased by 28%. Right. Here's the problem, though is the rate at which kids were entering the foster care system didn't change that much. Right. They still weren't leaving fast enough. And then I had the extra caveat of now you have more kids getting stuck in the foster care system. Right. By shortening the period at which parental rights are cut off, mm-hmm. you now have kids that are basically in foster care limbo. And a lot of and, and the reality is is that the majority of adoptions that come out of the foster care system are by younger individuals or are, are, are everyone uh, wants uh, a baby. Yeah, everyone wants a baby or an infant, and everybody wants uh, young children. Well, no one wants to take a teenager. And the longer they're in the system, the more damaged they become because they don't feel like they have a home. They don't feel like they belong anywhere. They're bouncing from home to home, and luck. If they're lucky, they have good foster parents. But if they're not. Um, they're bouncing from abusive home to abusive home. I told you about uh, when I was growing up, we were friends with um, this kid who was the biological son of this woman, but she had four foster children. And it was very clear that the only reason that mm-hmm. she had foster kids was to get a paycheck for having foster kids. Um, and so that situation happens, you know, all the time. People see it as an opportunity to make money and then ignore the foster children and it just kind of cycle through them. And it's, it's not it's not good for the kids. And then they get into their teenage years and they're completely damaged and no one wants to adopt them. And then they end up being homeless a lot of times, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Oh, we can even touch on that a little bit right now, right? It's okay. just the life outcomes of the foster care system is that you have more kids than ever now aging out of the foster care system. Mm-hmm. There is no other subgroup of the population that is more prone to homelessness and mental illness than a kid coming out, aging out of the foster care system. They have no Th- one. Th- think about that. Like, there, there's n- no other segment of the population is more at risk for being homeless and in poverty. Mm-hmm. And it makes total sense. Absolutely. You are literally coming, aging out of the foster care. You have no support. None. You have no support. You have no medical insurance. Some, some of them don't even have licenses. Like, 
you have nothing and you are literally being tossed on the street yep yep that's how much your country values you well it, it, it's just crazy it's insane to it's me it's heartbreaking it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking it, it's heartbreaking and it's so obvious uh, that this is a problem and this system and that it's work. reoccurring right and yet throughout history we've had the same solution right promote adoptions and continue to take more kids away from their families and here's the crazy part about this and so I, I was pretty harsh there about saying taking kids away from your families but here's the reality of it these social agencies uh, that are responsible for picking up your kid and sending them to foster care they only get paid if they take their your kid away they only get paid if they take your kid away the social That's, service agent or the the agencies responsible for the foster care system? social services okay Ugh. The, and that's one of the things that we'll, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more when we talk about the uh, director of the Baltimore City Department of Social Services. Yeah, so let's talk about her because I thought she yeah. had a lot of interesting things to yeah, say. Yeah, so uh, one, Paul, we ended up running into this TED Talk. Mm-hmm. I happen to be a big fan of TED Talks. But uh, her, her name was Molly McGrath Tierney. She uh, was the director of the Baltimore City Department of Social Services. Mm-hmm. Uh, she resigned, uh, I think, a few years ago in 2015 or 2016. Around there, yeah. Uh, but she had this really powerful message to say about the foster care system. She had really one word for it. It was insane. Mm-hmm. And she was referring to Einstein's definition of trying <laughs> the same thing over and over again, and it just S- not expecting working. A expecting a different result. Expecting something different. That's the definition of uh, insanity, in case you didn't know. So one of the things that really touched me about her speech, though, was that she really was trying to advocate for uh, intervening in families' lives early early before they end up having to get to a point where there's no other choice but to take their kid to foster care. Right. And so what she argues is that instead of putting all this money into uh, keeping hundreds of thousands of kids in foster care of which they don't want to even be in they much rather a lot of not all of them but a good portion of them want to be with their family right of course uh, we're not talking about kids that are coming from families where their parents beat them yeah if or if sexually we, abuse them yeah get them out of not. that house absolutely not. that's what foster care needs to be there for exactly right but what it doesn't necessarily need to be there for is uh when we have the capacity to intervene with parents that maybe are injured or end up getting uh, into substance abuse mm-hmm. or they have trouble paying their utility bill. They lose bill. their job. They, can't they lose pay their, their bills job, anymore. right? These are all warning signs that come way before a kid actually enters the foster care system. Mm-hmm. And that's where she argues that we need to be spending our money to intervene. Mm-hmm. Because the life outcomes, if we really cared about the kids, the life outcomes of the kids are best when they are with their biological family. And if we can provide that support, then the kids will be better off, and the families. And like you said, ignoring cases of physical or sexual or emotional abuse, most of the time these parents don't want to lose their kids. They just get put in such an unfortunate circumstance, whether it is illness or injury or job or, you know, substance abuse that they feel like they get backed into a corner and they don't have any other options and they lose their their child or their children. So if we can take steps to intervene before it gets to that point and ensure that this kid never has to go into the foster care system and, you know, take on the emotional and mental effects of that and the financial effects of that for the government, then that's a much more, you know, agreeable solution for everyone. Well, and and the big caveat to that though is that it's better for the, the family the mm-hmm. parents mm-hmm. so I, I can't imagine anything being more uh detrimental than having your child taken away from you like if you took D- uh, diesel's a dog and if you took him away i would lose my mind mm-hmm. right so i can only imagine what it would be like for for an actual child mm-hmm. and so really what, th- what this woman is trying to propose here is, is get away from just focusing on what's best for the child because we didn't right. get that right before and we're not getting it right now exactly right focus on what's best for that family as a whole and it will benefit the child in the long run mm-hmm. early interventions uh and also using the foster care as an absolute last resort because mm-hmm. again the premise of the the the, the, the 
monetary incentive for the foster care system is to take a kid away from a family. Well, and it just invites people to abuse the system, Absolutely. right? It's saying, hey, you want some money? All right, watch this kid, but you don't really have to watch it, but here's some money. Like, it just invites problems, and I, I don't think it's beneficial, um, not in the way it's structured now. There may be a way to structure it that it's more beneficial, but it's not that to me right now. Um, another perspective on foster care reform uh, comes from social advocate groups like Child Rights. What groups like this are most concerned about is what happens to kids when they are inside the foster care system. To many kids, it doesn't exactly look like a step up from the family that they were with before. So kind of like what we were saying, they a lot of times the families aren't great. They move from one abusive family to another or they're just being used as a cash cow. Um, and so there's a couple reasons that this happens. Depending on where you live in the U.S., there is often more kids in the foster care system uh, than the system is prepared to deal with. We talked about the rate at which kids enter the foster care system tends to be much higher than the rate that they leave. Throughout history, there have been pockets where the rate entering has dropped significantly, but it was never sustainable um, with the amount of kids that are leaving. We are back to the magic number now, like you said earlier, nearly half a million kids. And in the 90s, when we were at half a million kids, it led Congress to implement a new policy. Yeah, and uh, we're just kind of waiting now for Congress to make another decision, and we just hope it's not the same one. Again. Uh, <laughs> again. Again. I mean, uh, just try – I would take just any, about anything just the different. Yes. Uh, try uh, something different. Look at it from different. a different perspective because – Again, focusing just on what we think is better off for the child has well, basically screwed us. Well, it's clear this is not kids. working. So this leads to – the, the influx of kids leads to a second major problem that these advocacy groups are trying to change. And that's the quality of the care that the kids receive when they're actually in foster care. Right. So we talked about how right around the twenty or start uh, turn of the twentieth century is when foster care started to get regulated, mm -hmm. and that throughout the century, all the way up until the twenty first century, uh, it's becoming incrementally more regulated. Mm -hmm. Here's the problem: is that it was relatively manageable when we had about half the number of kids in foster care that we do today. Right. The problem is there's not enough caseworkers to actually manage all those kids. Yeah. So what you end up having is a bunch of family, foster families that have very little oversight and can do just about anything they want with these kids. There's just not enough and supervision. As you mentioned about your friend, sometimes these kids are basically just uh, – They're cash, cash cows. Yeah, they're cash mules. They, they, they just, they're just a, a free paycheck right? to neglect. And then they, you get to write them off on your taxes, and that's yeah. another whole yeah, – save more money. Yeah. So probably the most – obvious barrier uh, to trying to fix the foster care system is that the kids just don't want to be there. Yeah. And that's not a big surprise. Yeah. Right? It's an tr incredibly traumatic experience to be, t to, as, as a family member to watch your kid get taken away and then as the kid to watch you get yourself taken away from your family. Exactly. It, it's, it's, it's incredibly heartbreaking. I can't imagine how traumatic it is for the kid. Yeah, and you're and you're setting uh, you put yourself and now you're getting put into a family that you don't know, mm -mm. you don't have a relationship with, and there's no guarantee that they're going to treat you like a person. Yeah, and yeah, uh, and so uh, there was this kid in Michigan who uh, he was a foster kid who uh, I think he's re recently aged out, but uh, I'll have to look more into it. Mm -hmm. But his name was Robert Flippo or Flippo 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 Flippo. Flippo. Robert Flippo. Uh, he was a foster kid from Michigan, and I, I think he kind of said this best. He said, you don't just feel like doing anything after going through that whole situation. He was being asked by local reporters about the barriers that kids in the foster came, uh, system face when trying to get into college, and really the two th things that he listed were a lack of a support system. Mm -hmm. So, you don't, like I said, fewer caseworkers, fewer ways to, to get uh, these foster kids hooked up with the social services and mental health uh, support that they need. Right. And the other one's just trauma. Just you, dealing it, with like the you're, emotional you're, trauma. Yeah, like you, you wouldn't want to do anything either. Like you don't want to go to college. You don't want to, you know, aspire to anything at that point. You just want to be back with your family. Well, and I'm sure your self-worth at that point is just absolutely shot. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so the 
upside to that story is that uh, he ended up getting into college. Excellent. Uh, so he was in a state that's actually at the forefront of trying to reform the foster care system. Mm-hmm. and uh, Which was Michigan. At Michigan. But I- even his case, it's important to know that uh, him getting into college is such a rarity for kids coming out of the foster care system. Right. And that's all the more reason that we have to look into not only – okay, what is the care that these kids are getting in the foster care system? Right. But how do we even, what's our philosophy behind the philosophy, uh, the, uh, the foster care system in general? Mm-hmm. Why, uh, what are the reasons that we need to take kids away from their families instead of uh, trying to our best to intervene early when families are struggling? Right. And for whatever reason, we haven't really looked at that solution yet. And the irony is, is in the long run, it would probably be cheaper for the states. Mm-hmm. It would probably be cheaper because it's so incredibly expensive to have half a million kids in the foster care, in the foster care system. Exactly. system on an annual basis. Exactly. It, it's incredibly expensive. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's kind of just talk about what's going yeah. on here. So we've been looking at this, uh, the history of the foster care system, uh, We've been looking at kind of the same trend of policy changes, but it really just has been tiny tweaks here and there mm-hmm. uh, where we're like, oh, yeah, we'll reunite kids with their families. Oh, that's really hard to do. We're just going to adopt them out instead. Mm-hmm. Or we're going to try and come up with incentives to get the parents to, to get back into a, a, the standard of where they need to be to, to take care of their back. children. Yeah. But that just never seemed to end up happening. Why, how did we get ourselves into this this? constant loop of trying the same thing over and over again and it never working um i mean i think that it's one of those things where this problem got kind of ignored for a long time and they're like oh well we just you know nixon passed this thing so it's fixed now and we're doing so much better and then it deteriorated and deteriorated and it's kind of like if you had a crack in a dam and you just kept putting duct tape on it to try and fix it like okay it's gonna help a little bit but eventually the dam's gonna break and the water's gonna be everywhere yeah and eventually it's gonna end up becoming a a bigger problem right when it implodes and that's sort of what ended up happening in the late 90s is that you had this like uh uh, like the uh and i think it was like late 70s you had the foster care uh at about five hundred thousand kids dropped to about uh two hundred and fifty thousand in, in the late 80s and early and 90s. And then into the uh, mid to late 90s, back up to 500,000 again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We haven't been able to come up with a sustainable solution. And from my point of view, it really seems because our perspective is, 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 all, off. is, is off on this one. We, we've been so locked into this idea of whatever we need to do to, take, to make sure that these kids are well off is what we're going to need to do. So maybe we need to pivot the focus and do... You know, this may sound a little socialist, but how do we help this family do better instead of how do we keep this kid safe? Um, Again, obviously, there are certain cases where the kid needs to be taken away. But in most of them, why don't we focus on this family as a unit instead of this individual child? Yeah, no, I completely agree. And uh, on that note, uh, what's with this neglect term? So this is something I was reading. Uh, I, I did a little bit of reading into, and there's just so much ambiguity around what what it what it necessarily constitutes neglect, mm-hmm. and it's partially because it's intentionally vague. Mm-hmm. Uh, if whatever you're doing can be perceived as you not taking good enough care of your child, the government can just come in and take your kid away. Right. And it's really easy to report cases of neglect. So. I think that neglect is too generic of a term um first of all it's super negative connotation it's going to make anybody feel shitty uh, about their treatment of their their family um but so say that you had an injury or lost your job and you can no longer you know you can't really pay for clothes for your kids so they're wearing kind of clothes that don't fit and you have a hard time feeding your children so maybe they're kind of thin and so that technically would fall under the umbrella of neglect right but it's not because the parents aren't trying to provide for their children it's because they've been dealt a shitty hand and they're doing the best that they can and but they need help um 
So what are some interventions that we can do to provide that help? Like, so well, I think we, first and foremost. Um, so, so we talked about, uh, what, yeah, early intervention, we're for it. But what right. does that early intervention actually look like? Um, I mean, I think that we need to have um, ways to help people find new jobs, right? And then you have the whole issue of uh, the hospital and medical system and the way that they charge people. So we'll talk about that at a later podcast. But addressing... Um, you know, that's important, though, because, I mean, that, that's one of the uh, a big contributing factor to when a parent can no longer effectively take care of their kids. If they get hurt, now not only are they financially incapable, but they're physically incapable to take proper care right. of their kid. So how do you I, – I, I, I'm not necessarily sure I have a great solution to that. Um, as far as the medical issue goes, no, I don't have a great solution for that. I mean, other than um, maybe offering uh, relief programs for um, – certain types of medical bills or reduced or free child care for people that are injured that can't necessarily take care of their children or themselves. Um, again, I know that sounds really socialist, but it's better than the alternative. We're already wasting so much money on the foster care system. I think we can divert that money to do better jobs of making sure that the people in poverty don't continually perpetuate their poverty. And that brings up another good point is how, and this is the point that always has to be brought up with these topics is how do you pay for it? We have oh we have a, we come up with a great solution. How do you pay for it? Right. Where do you get the resources to fund it? Right. And are some of the problems in the foster care system due to just a lack of at least on the care aspect that kids get in the foster care system? Is that somehow in or in any way related to the amount of funding it gets? And does it need more funding or what's going on there? What do you think? Um. Uh I think we need to readdress what and how we are funding things, right? Again, let's stop paying people. Let's, we need to readdress paying people that are fostering children, right? Um, and then if we are able to have less children, significantly less children, entering into uh, foster homes and the foster care system, then that frees up a lot of money to then be diverted into these you know, maintenance and care programs to help people get back on their feet and be able to provide for their kids and continue to live a life. I, I, I agree. I think another thing that just kind of popped in, into my head, uh, I'm currently working on a podcast uh, episode for uh, substance abuse and addiction, so this is kind of seemed a little bit related, but substance abuse is a really big problem for uh, uh, as far as some families go and their kids enter the foster care system. If your parent gets a substance abuse charge, mm -hmm. your kid's gone. Yep. If you end up in jail, your kid's gone. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I wonder what role the criminalization of drugs and the still very present stigma around getting mental health services mm -hmm. for either addiction or just other mental health uh, problems in general. Right. And the availability of those resources because right. a, a lot of these services can be really expensive and are not always readily available and depending on the area you're well, I just think these are all great examples of how we continually, systematically oppress the poor in a way that keeps them poor, right? Um, we stigmatize mental health. We uh, have, you know, illegalization, or you know, marijuana is illegal in most states. We have very strict um, criminality associated with abuse when we should be do taking the medical route, I feel, in treating them instead of punishing them getting them to a place where they don't need that drug alternative anymore instead of treating them like criminals. It, and obviously it goes on and on and on, but we're, our system is set up in such a way that it really oppresses poor people to sustain their poverty. Um, and so there's all these different organizations that need to be looked at so that we can at least get these people to a level of mm -hmm. uh, homeostasis where they can live a life that's worth being alive for. Well, and uh, we'll definitely talk about more of this in, in the podcast episode dedicated to substance abuse, but I, I really do think this is really relevant to this, is that uh, to take a look at what Portugal did. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who are unfamiliar, Portugal, uh, about a decade ago, I think, uh, or close to a decade ago, uh, had decided to decriminalize all drugs. They called in a bunch of experts, like, we have a serious addiction and, and, and substance abuse problem. What do we do? Mm -hmm. Their recommendation, decriminalize all of it. Hmm. So if uh, 
you end up feeling like you are abusing a substance or you go to get addiction treatment uh, instead of putting all that money into the criminal justice system they put it into social services oh. so what they actually did was they said okay you have a problem and uh, what we're, what we're not going to do is send you to a court or to a judge. Right. You can go to a counselor on your own accord, and you will have a much better capacity to treat that client because you don't have the stigma of criminalization. Right. But on top of that, the government said, okay, for people that are struggling with addiction or substance abuse, they went to employers and said, will you hire this person? We will pay half of his wages. Hmm. So that was a, a solution that Portugal had implemented. It's probably a very expensive one. Yeah, I was going to say, it doesn't sound super sustainable. Well, uh, obviously they would pay the wages for a period of time. Right. And, and then, you know, it's not indefinitely. Right. Uh, and there's obviously fairly, you know, there's, there's stipulations to, to them paying the, 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 the wages. Right. But I think it's a solution that we could at very least humor here in the United States in some ways. And I think would really help. Uh, keep some of the, uh, especially the families that are dealing with substance abuse and addiction issues, where a lot of their ki or kids will end up in the foster care system as a result. Part of it is getting a sustainable job, right? Right, and so this might be one way to do that. And so take all that money that you're, d the billions upon billions of dollars you're pouring into the criminal justice system, and try the you know, public health approach. Try putting it into social agencies. Try putting it into employers' hands to get a more reliable workforce. Right. That's just one option. I, I, I bring it up just because I've been recently doing some, some uh, research on it, and it seemed fairly relevant to this case, uh, just because there is a large number of kids that end up in the foster care system because their parents had a substance abuse problem. And their parents ended up going to jail for it, or prison. And, again, the prison system will also be a podcast episode because that has its Niagara Falls of issues. Yeah, and so uh, is there anything else that we, we want to touch on? I mean, I just think to summarize, um, like a lot of the topics we talk about, this topic is uh, complex and complicated and will take a major overhaul to get to a point where the kids that are in the foster care system are few and far between, that they are not in the foster care system for long, and the only reason they are in the foster care system is because uh, their parents were extremely unfit to be caring for them. So like we said, emotional, mental, sexual, physical abuse. Um, and I would love to see that, you know, hearing about these children that spent their entire life bouncing around the foster care system only to end up homeless and, you know, in, in terrible situations. Like they were never, ever, ever given a no. chance. Um, and who knows what they would have been capable if they would have been given um, support and love and, and, you know, and a financial advantage. So, uh, yeah, I think this, as many of the issues we talk about, is something that needs a major overhaul. Yeah, and I just want to posit one more time that uh, I think there's a definite place in our society for the foster care system. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying we should get rid of it. Absolutely not. But I think we need to really reevaluate the way we look at it. Mm -hmm. And I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on where you think uh, the foster care system needs to go. What are some of the solutions that we can implement to intervene with these families before their kids get taken away from them? How do we m maybe need to change the way that these social agencies uh, uh, get their monetary incentives? Right. Because that seems a little bit sketchy that they get only get paid when uh, they take a they kid take away. A kid that, away. That, that's just weird. Mm, that's uh, so and, and maybe even look into... Uh, for if adopt if you think adoption is a viable solution, mm -hmm. what are some ways that we can reform the system such that maybe older kids uh, who would ordinarily not get adopted have at least a fair shot? Right. So let us know your thoughts. Yeah, guys. And what do you think we missed? Uh, what do you think we got wrong? What do you think we got right? What do you guys agree with? As always, if you liked this video, please be sure to like and subscribe to our channel. We put out new videos every Wednesday around noonish depending on how long my upload takes. Um, <laughs> the internet is very slow. It's not my internet. It's that my computer is not made for rendering and I need a new one. Oh, that's right. We have, we, have a, we have a bad laptop. It's not a bad laptop. It's just not built for rendering. It's built for gaming. But hopefully within the next couple of months I'll be able to... Uh, I think she's just making excuses at this point. It's not an excuse. Fake news. I was rendering a video yesterday and it is still rendering today, okay? My life is hard. <laughs>
It's difficult. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you Bye. next week. Bye.